Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming for uh, the seminar. This is the third year, and uh, this is the second last epic seminar of this term. And we have had speakers from across the world, uh, from Europe, from uh, India, of course from Canada. Today, for the first time, we are having a speaker from Australia. And uh, he is a very well-established, well-known researcher in the area of multi-phase flow. And multi-phase flow is one of our focus areas in Africa. And so it is a great pleasure for me to introduce Professor Jeffrey Evans from the University of Newcastle. Uh, he received his PhD in the 1990s from the University of Newcastle and uh, has been a prolific researcher and publisher and, uh, uh, of many, many papers on multi-phase flow. The beauty that you will see from the work is that he's another one. We have a few of them already in the series that can scale all the way from fundamentals of multi-phase flow to industrial applications. Uh, so his work is found applications in petrochemical and mineral, pyrometallurgical processing, water treatment, etc. And he looks at the fundamentals of bubble growth, the bubble dynamics, nucleation. Uh, so as I said earlier, spanning the entire spectrum. And in the talk, I see that he's also going to talk about COD, DEM, and EMS modeling approaches. So I'm really looking forward to the talk on hydrodynamic uh, interfacial phenomena and energy utilization, another important concept, even for the effort that we are putting into the NMI, which is about how to minimize energy in the processing operations, uh, <coughs> energy utilization in multi-phase systems. So please, Join me in welcoming for seconds. Thank you very much, Professor Kuna, for the kind invitation to come and talk today. I spent some time early today talking to the postgraduate students, and uh, there are definitely many synergies that uh, have taken place here at LSU and at Newcastle. So what I'd like to do is to move straight into my talk and give you some insights as to what we do at Newcastle, what our priorities are, and, uh, and how that relates to uh, some of the industries that are important to us at the Australia. <coughs> uh, briefly, that's uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, the only thing that I would say is that uh, my background is in experimental fluid mechanics, in particular related to plunging fluid uh, liquid jets, which is uh, a topic of research here at the moment. So, briefly, uh, Newcastle. Newcastle is uh, on the east coast of Australia, and that's about 100 kilometres north of Sydney. And uh, that's a view of the mouth of the Hunter River uh, on what, which uh, Newcastle is located. Uh, we've got some nice beaches and it's a nice sunny climate. Uh, our university was founded in 1965. We have about 30,000, 35,000 students, so it's not too similar to the university here. And we have about a few <coughs> academics. Uh, I'll be talking in particular uh, in terms of multi-phase processes. Uh, especially about a process relating to flotation because it contains many of the elements that, uh, that uh, occur in multi-phase processes plus some interfacial phenomena as well. And that flotation can occur in many different types of systems including fluidized beds, uh, stir tanks and so forth. If there is time, I'll talk about all of this work here is related to largely gas liquid solid systems. If I have got time, I'll talk about some uh, solid gas systems related to droplet dynamics, but only if I have time. Uh, here are some images around Australia. So we have the central partners of Australia here. This is the Great Barrier Reef, the Sydney, uh, the Harbour Bridge, and the Crawford Fossils, which is on the, the uh, southern part of, of Australia. What you may not realise, or you may do, I just see here's Wyoming is that it is very valuable in minerals. So not only above the ground, but below the ground, it's, uh, yeah, it's very significant. And Australia has a long history in, in mining and mineral processing. So previously it was coal, diamonds, 
base metals, mineral sands, and so forth. Iron ore, bauxite, coal. Uh, iron ore is a very large, it's our largest uh, export commodity uh, at the moment. The price has gone down below $40 a tonne. It's up to $55 a tonne, but it was well over $100 a tonne at one point. Now, Newcastle, which was on the mountain of the Hunter River, exports a lot of coal. It is the largest export coal port in the world. Uh, it's currently about 120 million tonne of coal per year. Uh, that coal is coming from the Hunter Valley, which is also home of um, horse stubs and, and wineries and so forth. So coal is an important part for us, and not surprisingly, Newcastle has a tradition of mineral processing. So here's an example of, you know, here's one of these coal ships that uh, we don't see that many of them off the coast of Newcastle, but there used to be a sort of a great uh, collection of them, but now they've sort of managed to do the same. <coughs> so we don't see as many of them, but uh, I just wanted to report you have tornadoes. Well, in 2007, I think we had the equivalent of your mini, or the mini tornado, and here's one of these. This is a 50,000 ton coal ship. Uh, there was a hurricane of something that came in. This ship had just uh, offloaded its ballast that was due to come into port. Uh, so it had lost all of its ballast that was riding high, and it failed to heed warnings about going out into the ocean, open water. And because it was so high, its propeller couldn't get traction, and it ended up on the uh, on the shore. So I was just reading up about this Pasha Volta. Uh, it was salvaged and went up to the Philippines, and it's got another name now. So it's another called another ship, I suppose, the previous one. But what it does is it just, for me, it shows the scale of these things. This is fifty thousand tons, and. The export is 200 million tonnes of wood, so these, you know, there are many of these things. So it's a very large operation. So, and most of that coal, or a lot of that coal, gets processed. Why Australian coal is so good is because it has low ash, low sulphur, uh, and because a lot of that is mineral processing. So for those who are familiar with the mineral processing, it's a separation process that Required that it's based on the surface properties. You have hydrophobic mineral that you want, you suspend it in the water, you agitate it, keep it suspended, you put bubbles through it, and those hydrophobic particles want to attach themselves to the, to the bubbles. Very simple process, and when you look at it, and hundreds of millions of tons go through this is that in this particular system, what control do you have? The only control that you have is a mechanical agitator, the impeller speed, which they don't like to change, and the amount of gas that you put into the system. So with very simple controls, I want to then now go into the underlying science of what makes it work. And uh, I never cease to be amazed that with a simple Impeller, a bit of gas coming at the bottom, all of the very you know, phenomenological things that can be achieved, and with great, um, you know, and it's an exacting, you either get it right or you get it wrong, and that surprises me that now the times that we actually can get, get it right with such so simple controls to the system. So here is a typical system here, this is a mechanical agitated system. Uh, there are hundreds of these things usually in series in parallel. We have our material coming in, our slurry, which may be 30% by weight of solids. We have a rotostator system, produce the bubbles, and then we produce the froth at the top. So that's a mechanically agitated system. Another case here is where we're using a bubble pulp. So we put the pulp in at the top, the bubbles rise to the, to the top here and collect it as a froth, and the pulp the liquid comes out of the other liquid material comes out of the bottom. Now, what I'll show later is why these systems have limitations. 
just keep in mind that these bubbles have to rise against the downflowing liquid. So if the liquid flow rate is too high and the bubbles are too small, they'll get carried back and you won't receive any product. So in about 1990, when I did my PhD, this is with the Jamison cell, it's a downflowing system because through surveys we realised that the best way to recover these particles is to use small bubbles and to have high contact. So traditional bubble columns, you're limited by the, up, the rise velocity of the bubbles. If the bubbles got too small, they wouldn't rise and they'd be carried down. This system generates with a high velocity jet, high velocity, I mean 15 metres per second, so it's not that high, is it can produce very fine bubbles. You can have volume fractions of over 50% in there. So you <coughs> If you have smaller bubbles, they'll get carried down much easier. So there's no limitation of bubble size. High volume fraction of gas, so you're getting very good recovery. And I think at latest, this is a Jamison cell, I think it's recovered something like $35 billion worth of product. So, and uh, Professor Jamison just last year won the Prime Minister's Prize for Innovation for this. So that there are other things that are going on. So that was essentially what my PhD was about. So, and here it just shows, here's the other thing that's important here is about particle size, and here's recovery. Large particles, low recovery. And the reason for that is that the bubble particle attachment is easily broken. You've got a bubble, and it's got this great big particle on it, so it's easily broken by the turbulence that's put in. You have an optimum here, very small particles. It's very difficult to collide the bubbles with the particles because they'll follow the streamlines around it. The bubbles will not be connected. The other thing about uh, flotation as well is that the import bubbles, the particle size is very important because grinding these materials is very expensive. Something like 80% of, of Australia's electrical production goes into crushing and grinding. For the minerals industry. So you don't want to grind it any smaller than you have to. So there is a close connection between bubble size and particle size. And the other part that is coming in here is this hydrophobicity. It's the it's the, um, you know, the the tendency of the bubble of the particle to want to attach itself to the to the bubble itself. So if you've got something that's strongly hydrophobic, there's a strong bond between the bubble and the particle. So when we're talking about energy here, is that particularly up in this range, you have to be very careful about how much energy you put in, otherwise you're going to, after collecting the particles, you're going to knock them off again. So a lot of work has gone into doing that. So this is much the same uh, work here. You notice here that Smaller bubbles give you greater rate constants, increasing the gas rate, and the other term is the collision of the collection efficiency. So the minerals industry is there's quite a lot of empiricism in that. So they've defined this rate constant, and you can see here, here is the rate constant going down as the bubble size increases. They also introduce this collection efficiency, which is a combination of the collision efficiency, in other words, does this particle strike the bubble or will it go around the streamlines, the attachment. The attachment is like this. Imagine yourself at the fair or the show when they put the great big beach ball out and you get dropped on the top, slide around the surface and you get thrown off the end of it. Well, this is the same as a particle. It hits it, slides, it's got to drain and then penetrate into the particle. In other words, be collected before it slides off the bottom. And so there is this interaction time. So then they have this induction time where the particle penetrates into the bubble forms of three-phase contact line. And the, the idea is it has to attach itself before it slides off the edge. And that is a lot to do with the chemistry, so that's the attachment. 
just because the particle hits the bubble doesn't mean it actually will stay up. So just briefly, we have this collision step, we have this attachment where these things slide around the side and then they can form a three-phase contact line up on the top. So in other words, you've got actual physical penetration into the particle, into the bubble itself. And then the final part is detachment. It's just as important with that you don't detach the particle once it's collected. Now, what the big push is at the moment is if you want to crush and grind, it costs a lot of energy. So it's called large or coarse particle flotation. So there's a lot of effort that goes into now collecting as large a particles as possible, extending that range. And so therefore you have to be very mindful of the detachment. And so therefore you need to minimise the amount of energy or to be more careful about how you put the energy in. It's no longer a case of just pumping in lots of energy, which is good for the collision, but it's no good for the detachment. Uh, this is simply the force balance. I know that there's a strong DEM group here, so it's, uh, these are the forces that are taking, that are taking place here. Uh, what we have here, we have the gravity force, which is just the weight of the particle. This is the force balance on the particle. We have the buoyancy. We have what's called the capillary force. If you can see this particle, it's actually penetrated into the bubble, and so there's a capillary action. That capillary action will be causing the particle to be pulled into the, into the bubble. So that's an attachment force. And then we have a pressure force. And that's the pressure force exerted by the difference in pressure between the inside of the bubble and the liquid outside. Now that pressure force can either be attaching or detaching depending upon the hydrostatic headers and the size of the bubble. And then we have the uh, fluid force or the fluid drag on the particle as it moves around the surface. <coughs> so here's an example here. This is a case of where we have sliding. So then there's the question of, is, does that particle roll over the bubble surface or does it slide? Because that makes a difference to the modelling analysis of it. So, what we have here is we have this particle attaching, approaching the surface of the bubble. So this H is the separation distance from the radius of the bubble to the centre of the particle. This line here, once we reach this point, that's when there is zero separation distance. So the particle, edge of the particle is just touching the edge of the bubble. So here's the experiment. So this is the H. At this point, you see a jumping. So it means that this bit here is actually inside. And so that would be deemed when you've got collection. So this thing is sliding around as a function of time. These are milliseconds. It's sliding around as a function of time. And can it jump into here? This is our modeling analysis just including those forces that we have in present. And you can see here that what we've got is that we've got this particle penetration in the formation of the three-phase compact line, and this is its equilibrium position. So what do you do in that position? Um, the other thing that's happening as well is that there is, you know, that these bubbles and these particles move around on the surface because, you know, you've got the particle gets pulled in, the pressure force increases, pushes it out a bit, then it gets drawn back in. So there's an oscillation. Well, of course, what you can do is then to start to introduce more forces because we've got double layer forces, van der Waals forces. 
once we get to these very small particles in a few microns, then we're going to get other imitation forces that are taking place here. And as you can see here, that the, the DEM can actually, you know, we can match, you know, we can match the experimental information by being mindful of additional forces that are taking place. Now that's a tuning exercise. So there's a lot of discussion about the, you know, the various strengths of the Van der Waals forces and so forth. So the problem with a lot of these other forces, these surface forces, is that the way that they're being modelled is that the magnitude of these forces approaches infinity at zero separation distance. So what you then have to do in the, you know, in the literature is that they have cutoffs. And so do you cut off, you know, do you cut off that force at, at three nanometers or five nanometers or seven nanometers? And if you've got a function that's approaching infinity, yeah, it makes a big difference. So that is a whole area in itself once you start looking at those integration forces. Where that comes into, so of course with the DEM, why stop at one particle when you can have a number of these particles? So here's some DEM work that we've got uh, of particles, two different types of particles with different hydrophobicities. And you can see here that they become attached or collected on the surface of the bubble. And you may have seen is that they're different colours and the ones with the higher phone of hydrophobicity will actually remain on and then they start pushing the less hydrophobic particles on. And in flotation, that's uh, in flotation modelling, it's important to work out how many particles you can fit onto a bubble because that's directly gives you the recovery. Can I put 50 particles on this bubble or can I put 200? What is its capacity? So if you're doing population balance models and looking at recovery of bubbles, of particles by bubbles, then it's important to know what the, uh, what the loading is. Now with the DEM, that gives us insight into that. So here are some other cases. So what we've been trying to do is experimentally is to is to look at the particle bubble interaction process. Now, in real systems, these bubbles are moving around. The bubbles and particles are moving around. It's very difficult to visualise. So in this particular case, we're keeping the bubble stationary and we're dropping particles on, and you can see. It's not an easy task. They, everything moves around like, like this. You can see it bounces. Now they, bubbles have got really tough surfaces. And these things can easily slide off by the time you know, without actually getting locked in. The problem with this system, of course, is that all of the action, all of the collection occurs at the back of the bubble. So if you have a, a held bubble on an orifice, you don't get the behaviour at the rear of the bubble. So we can we can do the DEM work, and this all of this behaviour is reflected uh, in practice. You can see the bounce where these part, these particles can bounce off the bubbles. And that's largely by the pressure force. The particle at one point comes, you know, overlaps. It's got such a high pressure force, pressure differential, the resultant force will push it out. The limitation, of course, with this system is that we've got spherical bubbles. We can't move the shape of the, of the bubble. This is the real system. Now what we have here is an oscillating grid system, so we're actually generating turbulence. Here is a bubble and a particle attached. It falls off. But the other interesting thing about it is if you can see that the grid is down below. So this bubble particle aggregate 
has been subjected to the turbulent flow field for some time. It's not an instantaneous process. You can see it rocking around. So, one of the things that we're looking at is that, like all of these processes, many of them are dynamic processes. So, this is some of the expressions for the collision. Uh, this is the attachment, sorry, this is the detachment or stability, and this is the uh, collection. We've got various terms in here. Uh, there's but the point I want to mention here is this bond number. This bond number is a ratio of the, of the detaching to the attaching forces. If you look here, here are some yeah, expressions, largely empirical expressions for the bond number. Here is the energy dissipation rate. That's a significant. This is where the level of agitation or the energy dissipation rate comes into the system. So, in our system, or bubble particle aggregate system, is subjected to instantaneous changes in any of these forces, then we will get a time-dependent bond number. And so what you can see here is that we can actually look in more detail about what the bond number is. So if I said that the bond number is a ratio of detaching to attaching forces, if the bond number is more than one, what should happen to the particle? It should detach. But that's not really the case. What do I mean by detach? In all it says, by detach I mean it, moves, it means that the force is moving the particle away from the bubble. So it hasn't detached yet, but it is moving in a direction where it is going to, you know, it's moving away. But in the next instant, the forces could change and could cause the particle to move back in another direction. So what you see here is when you're looking and say this thing is spinning around, all the force directions are changing. So the bond number is changing. So in this case, you can see bond number of less than 0.35. But there are cases, I'll look at the next one, is that here's a bond number of... You know, here is a bond number where it's more than one. So it's gone up to 1.5, and these are very small time frames. But it is in such a position where, at the next time instant, the change in you know, the force will move back into the other direction. And this is a case here where you get some sort of catastrophic breakdown where the bond number does become more than one. In other words, the resultant force is moving the particle away from the bubble and then it's just gone. So I think that's one of the really beautiful things about the DM is that we can model this instantaneous behaviour and move away move away from this type of well it's not complete empiricism but uh, the beauty about the DM is that it's you know, you're just resolving all of the forces <coughs> that come into it. Now, it's very interesting in, as I said in flotation, they, they talk about the probability of collection is equal to the probability of collision, attachment, and one minus detachment. And there are models for the probability of detachment. And one of these models is based on looking at the centrifugal force of a, of a particle bubble aggregate that is trapped within an eddy. Now, if I go back to this very first step up here, look at that. Is this spinning around the surface of the bubble? No. It just falls off. It falls off the bottom. But up until recently, all of the literature, the bubble breaker, 
or for bubble for the particle detection of, is based on a bubble particle aggregate spinning around in a vortex. So what we've been working on, one of the students has been working on this for months, is to try and capture that. So what we've done here is that we've got a water tunnel and we've got a cavity in which to generate a circulating flow of that. And then we've passed the bubble through a fluorized bed, put particles on it, and hopefully observed this spinning around. So here is an image of a bubble that's spinning around there and it does get maybe not in this one but they do get detached. So that was sort of really the first visual evidence to say that you yeah, that there is some experimental validation of this theory of a, of a particle being detached by a, a spinning vortex. Now, this thing is spinning around at a you know at a hundred cycles a second. They really uh, move very quite quickly. Now, like all of these things here, is that this is the one. Here's one where it's spinning around. This thing is spinning around, and you can see it's being detached. But of course, once you actually start to look at these things in more detail is that there are many mechanisms by which this particle can be detached. So this is the case of that swinging motion where it gets full, it falls off and so it doesn't have to spin around. And here is another case of where you've got coalescence. So you've got a particle on the surface, on the surface here, you've got coalescence of, of bubbles and then you've got this you know, particle being dropped off. So, when we're looking at our detachment processes and so forth, then yeah, there are a number of different mechanisms that are taking place. And here is another one with collision where they just get knocked off as well. So it's not really fair to model your entire detachment process based on, a, on this vortex motion when it could happen by any number of processes. Uh, we've done work here with a, an oscillating grid and we've been looking at, uh, at bubble particle interactions. This is fairly standard and we've used PIV to, to fully characterise the liquid flow field. Uh, we're interested in the energy spectrum here, so as was said before, is that one of our aims is to, is to put target amounts of energy into our system to do the stuff that we want. Now, how can you get that from energy dissipate from a specific energy dissipation rate to? So what we've done is we've moved over into the field of more of mechanical engineering. Uh, and I know now why they have wind tunnels and so forth. So it's about all to do with length scales and resolutions. So this is an interesting part about if you if I spoke to mechanical engineers, they've all got wind tunnels and so forth. And the reason for that is that they use air system and they, they need large links, links scales to resolve this. If you look at, at this system here, this is a wave number. We use, this is all POV generated data. And this thing is 10, um, down here is 10 microns. And our, our traces are, what, 10 microns? So we're trying to resolve velocity fluctuations of 10 microns down here, but the size of our tracer particles are 10 microns. So really there's, yeah, there's a lot of questions about the validity of the data in this region. But if you're looking in here, this is the millimetre to the 100 micron size. And that's where we're interested in because that's looking at where the bubble particle, you know, the bubble size, the particle size is. And so that's where, that's sort of the energy, part of the energy spectrum that we're very interested in. So we've forgone the, you know, the, the sort of the resolution down at this scale to work on 
lottery one. The significance of this, though, is that it gives us an insight of energy and putting it into the right length scales. Like, if you were to break up a bubble, you want to have the length scales or maximise your length scales at the size that we want the bubble to break up. So, if we can modify you know, the spectrum, we want to know exactly which wave number or length scales that we've, uh, we're changing. Uh, just briefly, the PID system we've got, this is a particle with a bubble attached and it just shows that this particle is moving around, it's flapping, the bubble is moving, flapping around, and we use PID to get the instantaneous, I think uh, you know, we can do sampling frequencies of up to 5,000 frames per second or 10,000 frames per second. So that's been a big boom for us is that we're looking at the instantaneous velocity fluctuations around the surfaces of these bubbles. And from that, we can get the, this is the velocity field on the surface of the bubble as it's flapping around. And we can get the kinetic energy. And this is where you get detachment. You can see these instantaneously, there's these high regions of uh, energy dissipation. And so what we end up getting is that while we have a very low um, overall energy dissipation rate in the system, there are local instantaneous levels that are much higher. And if we can apply that to the theory, then what it shows here, for example, is that this is the, um, this is the instantaneous uh, the circles up at the top of the instantaneous energy dissipation rates around the surface of the bubble at the point of at the point at which it detaches, and you can see that it you know it matches the theory. And down here you get no detachment, even though the average conditions are exactly the same. Just move on from that. Um, we've been trying to visualise this flotation for this collection collision process in flotation for quite some time. The difficulty is like if you were seeing that bubble spinning around that vortex at 100 cycles per second, it's just impossible to capture. So what we've done is that we wanted this, this is amyloid, this isn't a bubble, this is an amyloid. And the reason why we've used amyloid is that it's got a density of about 1,020. So it's almost, well it's positively buoyant. We can change it to neutrally buoyant by using salt water. But here's a case of where the interfacial tension of this is so, is 0.025, well, it's a fraction of that of water. If you breathed on it, our problem was that this is like gossamer thinness. The interfacial tension is, is only a 2, you know, a, a 0.02 or something. What's the size there? Uh, that, I think, is about a 5 or 6 millimeter dropper. So when you say 0.025, what's the unit? Point, uh, newtons per metre interfacial tension compared to water, air, water is 0.072 so it's a, a fraction of it and this is the DEM work and as you can see that this, if you just vibrated this in that whole droplet would shatter so here's a particle forming on it and the surface remains intact we still had the problem, and here's where, here's where it's actually been captured inside. The DEM shows this bouncing approach here because we don't have a necking uh, capability in the DEM, where in the real system there is a necking. But in terms of flotation, we've always had this limitation of that this 
you, know, you can see here that the particle is captured, but it's still attached to the nozzle, which has been a real limitation. So this is the fascinating part. So these are, this is a six millimeter. These are um, a hundred micron particles. You have a look at this. So now we've been able to levitate a droplet. And this is true flotation process where you can see all of these things that are coming around the side. And you can see that they're captured in follow with the, the DEM work. So I think they're probably about the first experiments that we've, I've ever seen captured where you've where you've got it. So what's happening here is that this bubble, we're just gently putting in more and more animal each time and just pushing off the, just launching this, this droplet at a very low rate and so we can see the entire flotation process. And as you see, the, uh, the DEM work uh, follows that quite nicely. So, the other stuff in terms of what's happening here is that we're trying to model the, in the CFD uh, sphere about this flotation process. Now, uh, again, we're trying to capture these vortexes. I'll just show you some. There's been work that's looked into uh, in defining what these vortexes are, but what you can see here, this is, I think, using a VOF. This is the work with um, Sebastian, which is where you've got, we've put a bubble in here, and this is the vortex trail, because the cross bubble, and you can see, so this is the historical bubble, and we've actually got the, we've actually got the particle that's attached to the, to the surface of the, uh, of the bubble. So here's another case where you can, we're interested in this, whether, whether that particle leaves the bubble or not uh, after being subjected to these different vortices. vortices. And this is the body fraction. And the ultimate is, of course, that uh, this is work done by Peter Cohen uh, at CSIRO, is where they've put it into a population balance model to look at the actual flotation of the cover. And uh, I see that that's an area that with the DEM, there's very much that you can uh, do that. Now, we've done work of that oscillating pressure field, and here's a bubble. Here's a bubble. And that's fascinated me. I call it a warty bubble. And Maya, did you generate it? Maya generated these. And, like, how does a bubble do that? Here it is, and it's, it just shivers. And it's like a golf ball or a raspberry, and you think, what impact that would have on the heat and mass transfer? Where does it come from? And of course, you can't repeat those things, because wouldn't it be lovely to be able to produce these all the time? So that you've just got this whole sort of bubbly mixture of these shivering <coughs> bubbles the mass of heat transfer would be uh, incredibly high. Uh, we haven't been able to repeat that, but what we're doing is we're starting to model this, but uh, so rather than to spend years in the lab trying to repeat, you know, to try and replicate those conditions, I should ask Mayer if he has his experimental data book, because if you had a a really good experimental data book, you would have noted that observation, well you wouldn't see it, but you would note all the experimental conditions. But that was something that just came out um, looking through old data. But if you look at this, this is a bubble droplet, 70 microns, and this has been applied a pressure field. And this is what this, I think it's a droplet, and this has got particles attached to the surface, but I thought this warty bubble, but then if you look closely, there's, you know, you can get these things to do anything. So we've been looking at a whole lot of pressure for various reasons. And if you've got 
with GEM work, it's basically a porcelain balance. We do velocity information. So how do you convert velocity into a force? Well, the idea is to convert that energy spectrum, well, the velocity spectrum into the energy spectrum, and from that, you can get the pressure spectrum. So if we're looking at the oscillations of turbulence, then maybe we can understand the turbulence in terms of the pressure spectrum and then uh, utilise that in, in what a bubble might do. So the beauty about these shell bubbles is that you can put properties onto the interface and in flotation you have, you have different um, surfactants in the present. So that suits us very well. And so we've actually done the pressure spectrum. Now, if you look at this energy spectrum information from velocity, it's been going for about 20 <coughs> years. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of publications. There are practically no publications on pressure. And that's what we're doing. We're converting the pressure spectrum, but the velocity spectrum into pressure. Putting it in the DEM uh, and including that in our that in our force analysis. Now, there's a challenge with the pressure spectrum is that you can't measure it. Like the pressure in our system is so small, it's you know less than one millimetre water gauge. So you, and how do you get a pressure measuring device that measures one millimetre water gauge at high frequency uh, and in a non-disturbed way? So it's quite a challenge. But uh, we've actually gone quite a long way. So we've taken actual pressure information turned it into an oscillation and then moved that into or applied it to the to the bubble. So and we can do we've spent quite some time trying to solve the uh, Rayleigh Plesser equation in the shell bubble case. Uh, one D is hard, two D it's getting really difficult, three D system is, is really quite challenging. So uh, we've done some of that in the uh, VOF framework. <coughs> And just briefly, is that uh, this is where you're doing levitating. We wanted to do that um, with the idea of levitating <coughs> bubbles in flow. Remember our flotation system, our problem was holding a bubble that would be rising in a stationary manner so that we can visualise it. So the idea is to try and do this. They can levitate it with droplets in air. Here is a case of a levitated droplet. This is applying these pressure fields. And it can do all sorts of things that you like. So we try to mimic that experimentally with, uh, with bubbles. So, and you can get all the different, um, different harmonics of these systems. So uh, that's an experimental area. Uh, and here's some work that we're doing with the oscillation of putting, applying these things to a, a uh, pressure field, uh, an oscillating pressure field. The reason why that we're doing that is, and I'll just finish that off, is that if we're looking at our collision models, the collision models are actually for bubbles of constant size. But if you apply a pressure field, they're going to be oscillating in and out. So you've got these particles trying to collide with them that are oscillating in and out. So that will affect the collision uh, efficiency. I'll just leave that there for the moment. Um, but I just want to move on. I know I've only got a, a few more minutes, but I just want to show you some other thing. One other thing that uh, I think is, is relevant. trying to get velocity measurements in a fluidized bed. So, in this particular case, these are uh, high precision uh, uh, glass spheres that we've coloured them. And we've been able to track the motion of these. We can track the motion of these things. 
So here are some of our images uh, with the iPad with the tracking motion. And we can follow it around in 2D. And we get instantaneous velocity measurements as a function of time. Now there's an issue here about the sampling rate and sampling size. Uh, it's very much a function of the, you know, this is should be the same material. So there's a, an issue to be resolved with the sampling size. But we then moved on to this other case of where we're using, in this case it was MATLAB to track these bubble, these particles. We can get the velocity information. This is the x, y. This is in a round column. But we'd always love to get the third component of the velocity. So this is a 2D measurement. So from that we can get the acceleration as well. So it's interesting here because if you're looking at these accelerations, you know, if it's going in one direction, if it's then all of a sudden changing its acceleration in the other direction, what would cause that to happen? It must have collision. So we're interested in the dispersion coefficient as a function of concentration. So we're looking at particle mean free complex. But we spent some time thinking, well, how do we how do we get that third direction? Do you use stereo cameras and all of that kind of stuff? What we noticed was, well, have a look at this. You may not. This is, again, layers data. This is PIV data. But what you can see here, can you see these things are moving into their diameter is changing as they move you know, in and out away from it? So if you take the xy velocity, but you can also have information about the change in radius with time, and that gives you some information about how fast it's moving in the other direction. So we've sort of in the process of going through all of that, looking at the differences in changes in radius and, and start to get information about the acceleration in all three directions. Now, I asked somebody and I said, there's something going to be really strange about my talk. And it's on this slide. And what captures, what makes you think about this slide? So I'm getting the acceleration in all three directions. Have a look at the accelerations of 6,000 metres per second squared. Now, how many Gs is that? These things must be, well, if you got hit by one, you'd be in trouble. <laughs> so... I think there's still a bit of way to go because we're dealing with very small, you know, we, we have this um, we have this this issue here of resolving Yeah, resolving what these boundaries are. It's particularly difficult on a black background. So very small changes. So we I think we've got a reasonable measure on working up the centroid is, but resolving what these these boundaries are is uh, quite, quite a challenge. So I think I've used the up most of the time, so I think I'll leave that there, and uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much for such a wide range of very high resolution experiments and simulations to understand the fundamentals of what we're doing. I'm open the floor for some questions. Yes. Yes, that one. So when you get close to the surface, 
we assume that there's some uncertainty in the ground before you can you travel up and things like that. But before you get to the surface, supposedly you should know everything about particle dynamics and fluid properties and everything. So I would start the approach to that contact that you should approve the ground. Oh, in this in this particular part, this particular part here, they should be they should be a, a agreement with that. There is there is some uncertainty about that because what we have is that you're looking at the little <coughs> drag. Here is your here is your bubble. And then you've got your particle, and you're applying a hydrodynamic drag on this as well. So there are models that have got hydrodynamic drag in the normal tangential directions. So that there, there is some, yeah, that, that's a, a research area in itself. So these are not particles. Just freely fall, yeah, you know, they are freely falling to some extent, but once you're getting close to the boundary of the the boundary of the uh, of the bubble, then then it does become a much more complex problem. Is your boundary of your bubble a mobile or an immobile surface? And that will affect what the hydrodynamic drag models are. So in this particular in this particular case here, well, if, actually this was some of our earlier experimental data, and uh, I was not the data is the data is pretty good, but I'd like to repeat some of that data as that some of that data as well. And so yeah, I think that there's more work that's been done that needs to be done for that. So that could be the discrepancy could be due to the thinness of the bubble surface or something. Yeah, or even the distortion of the bubble. And, and one of the big issues about this about this drag model and the sliding model is if I look at this particular case, is that if you what what is the drag force on a particle that is on the surface of a, of a bubble, what's its drag force? Now, if this particle is actually inside the bubble, what is the drag model that should be applied to that? So that's one of the things that I'm particularly interested in, is, and if you look at it, and this is where Joss Dirksen comes into it, is that for us, our modeling approach is having a particle attached approaching a surface. And a lot of our forces, particularly those uh, the uh, indication forces, have been developed or their approximations, but they 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 have they have um, had zero separation, those forces approach infinity. And then it, they, and then it just became a question of where do you cut it off? And there's been this endless Questions about is it three nanometers, five nanometers? You can cut it off anywhere, you can get any number you like. And then I saw Joss Dirksen's work, and what they're doing is the opposite, where they're starting the bubble, the particle on the surface, and lifting it off. And they don't have this problem of infinite forces when it's on the surface. So they've taken a different approach. And so I'm sort of working towards. Joss Dirksen's case of let's take his model, their models. So if you're looking at this separation distance here, so this might be H and this is the, the force here. So the forces that we've typically gone here are approaching infinity, but Joss Dirksen's model starts off with some finite force at H, <coughs> at H at, at the, the boundary. So the obvious thing is, is just to cut it off like that is to, is to match the two and then as you move this particle into the bubble the, once it's completely in the bubble the force is zero so it must then cut off like that 
that. So this bubble would look, particle would look like that. It might look like that here, that here, that here, yeah, and so forth. That's where it's positioned relative to the surface. And I think one of the beauties would be as if we had a, you know, a complete model that gave us the drag force across that entire range of positions rather than just that individual case. Paris is an expert maybe an expert clearly in the synthesis and stuff. What do we put you yeah. maybe on one day that you can Oh that would be great, right. yes. These the last one the turbulent or for the particle base? No. Oh these these particular ones, these are for quiescent systems. Okay. So we do different words. So this is this is where there, there's a long, strong focus on the DEM, but it doesn't have the CFD attached to it. What we have done is some of Yushio's DNS work transferred the, the flow field around it to do it. But but this is just a quiescent forming system. Excellent, uh, the question is about uh, uh, using the uh, k to the power minus pi curves. Is that applicable for our systems with lots of bubbles, particles, all of the things? To still expect your kinetic energy spectrum to show minus pi curves and peaks the way you expect them? Can I hand that out to Mayo about all the things? <laughs> 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 Maybe the expert here is. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, think, I'm just thinking about all of, all of that work. Is that what I haven't done in in our system? All of that work at minus five and three that we gave you was for the that was for the liquid only system in that oscillating, largely in that oscillating grid system. What we've done is we've put bubbles into it. But only at a very small, at a very small uh, volume frame. Yeah, you know, almost single bubbles, just a bubble flumes. And we do have information about the additive effects of that. But all of the bubble color work that that energy spectrum was was done while Maya was there. Is this a DMS work by Trendus? Yeah. About two hundred three hundred bubbles. And the last number of many, 220, 20. So he tried to compute that kind of factor. And uh, I'm sure, uh, yeah, but it's generated by the problem of water. That's the source of But that is good, but where the real, I think where the real interest is in is the pressure spectrum. And that is, uh, and I think that's much better for our DEM, DEM work. Is because that's much, much more uh, uh, readily put into our force balance rather than go through some drag model. So you, you don't need the drag model. Probably the pressure field, the material pressure field, is <coughs> non local yeah. so, so if you try to try to correlate pressure fluctuations with your velocity fluctuations, well, this is. Uh, this is our <coughs> that's us. This is our velocity vector field that we've got, and this is how it transfers into the uh, into the pressure into the pressure field, and where we. The difficulty about this is in this field, it's, it's um, you know, the velocity fluctuations are such that the pressure fluctuations here are like we're talking about pascals. So the highest ones are about 10 pascals. So you can't really, you can't really measure it. But what we have been able to do is there's been some DNS work from Srinivasan that has got um, some information about the, 
about um, length scales or pressure length scales that we've been able to relate back to it, and it's, there's a, a, a definite consistency to it. But you may have other systems where conceivably you could actually measure the, you know, the pressure, the pressure spectrum, and that would be beauty if you could, you know, you can't get velocity fields, but you may be able to get a pressure, a pressure spectrum through some external source or external probe or something. Um, more of a conceptual question, then. it goes back to the, uh, uh, the, the drag models and the, the sliding of the models. You, you mentioned that the bubbles can be generated in an extreme vortex. Is there, a, is there a functional difference between the, the model where the, the particle slides on the bubble versus the, the, the particle is Call it stationary on the surface of the bubble, and the bubble itself is very big. In terms of detachment, mm -hmm. <coughs> I, what the, basically the, the, the what you're doing here, you're working at a centripetal field here, and um, you know, does it? You know, you have to resolve those into two different courses. So there is conceptually a, a very big difference to it. Now, what I'm thinking, one of the work that we did with this article, and we had this bubble attached, we're looking at detachment. Now, what you have here is the thing that's holding it on is the capillary force and you have this contact angle. And how is this bubble going to get off the surface? You could pull it off the surface, like I've got something which has a suction I pull it off the surface. And that, that requires a certain force. Yeah, it could require a greater force. But I could also if I had a screwdriver, I could just prise under here and then it could flip off. So that there's this other tangential force which isn't sort of just tipping this over or changing it. In other words, just sort of prising it off so that it more or less gets pulled off by that side. So there are definitely two mechanisms by which you can do it. So if you're looking at so what's the force required to sort of like tip it over that way and slide it off or pull it off from the top, uh, you would have to, you could do the force balance and look at the two of them and find out what the relative magnitudes of them are. So yes, it is, it is very much a, it, it, it would give you different answers. And that's why that work where we looked at even that vortex, we, like people don't, it's so hard to see detachment taking Take, taking place, and those things where all of those different mechanisms were captured to show all of those things were happening. So, it would seem a bit strange if you modelled it completely one way, say this rotating vortex, when you've got a picture here to say, that ain't rotated. Yeah, it, it, it's a bit, you know, it's, well, it's a bit unreal. You might give you the right answer, but you're not using the right approach. The last question. Yeah. Yeah, um, so, when you say that uh, you're estimating the pressure, pressure spectrum, uh, you might so that integration has to to work perfectly. You need to have all three directions of velocity, or make the assumption of some kind of isotopy or something. Yeah. Yeah, those ones, there was the isotropy that has been demonstrated. So, for the oscillating group problem? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The iso yeah, that's why we could, we could do that. But there is some work, I think, that that is Apple is doing that is considering non-isotropic cases and how that may be, how that may be considered. I think that may even be in the latest paper. Yeah, because if you have to compute 
pressure spectrum from velocity correlation you would have to consider yeah. uh, averaging out in all three directions. Yes. Yes. And that's a big challenge is how do you expand the how do you extend the two D data into three D uh, if you you know if you're assuming isotropic then there's a, a validity to that. Yeah that's one way to, to do it. But yes you do need to take into consideration all those three so it's done through the Navi spectrum equation. Okay, I think this is an excellent illustration of uh, trying to understand the fundamentals of a device that is used widely in the middle processing industry. Rotation cell. I think Jameson cell is one of the most widely used in that. It is, like I said, it's. Uh, it, and the thing, if I went back to the beginning of the talk, and I said, well, if you look at this flotation process, any step of it along the way is, you know, even that induction time. If the light, it, if it slides around and doesn't attach beforehand, it's gone, it doesn't happen, no flotation. So we're doing all of those things in a mechanical impeller with some gas. But if you look at the Jamison cell, all of that's being done is with a pipe, two pipes. One pipe is the down cover, and the other one is a nozzle. And it does all of that. It's really an ingenious device that was developed basically through experimentation, I guess, right? It is. Without really going into the details of complex interplay of forces, whether so there's initial forces, or integration forces, buoyancy forces, etc. And in a complex multi phase mixture, there are solid particles, there are bubbles, there's water. So, multi phase flow is uh, one of the challenging equipment we have to think about it today for the it is. It's a very good, you know, it's a very good example. Uh, the petroleum industry and all of your industries. Are, it doesn't really matter which yeah. industry. It's the same not principles. Not, yeah. So uh, it's a nice illustration of how to bring science into an art, which was, of course, done much before science evolved. I think. And uh, Epic is about trying to understand these particles, flow, but in a way newer. Code. So hopefully, understanding these processes. And will help us innovate on this uh, design as well. So please join me in thanking Professor Evans for <laughs>